Hello, my name is Steve D'Agostino, and my co-host Anne Fernald and I welcome you to the Twice Over podcast, because to teach is to learn twice over. In this episode, Solving the Puzzle, we are joined by Natasha Burke, Assistant Professor of Psychology at Fordham University, who shares her experiences as an instructor and researcher making the transition to online while trying to support her students and stay connected to her work in these challenging times. Natasha, can you tell us a little bit about how long you've been here and what you're teaching this semester and just introduce yourself to everyone who's listening? I am in my second year here at Fordham, so pretty brand new here. I am uh, this semester teaching Foundations of Psychology, which is basically like the Introduction to Psychology course, teaching two sections of that, and also teaching a clinical supervision for the graduate students in clinical psychology. What are you noticing that your students need right now in this transition to moving online? And the transition to moving online, I mean, I don't know if I'm noticing it so much as I feel like they need it is kind of what we all need is routine and consistency. And so I think kind of upending everything, um, changing to a whole new format. I think the thing that is helpful for them is to have some kind of consistency of this is the way we did class before and how much of it can we kind of retain to keep it as similar as it was in the in the past. And I think for my class, at least, it's been really helpful trying to kind of retain all the elements that we could in this kind of new format. It certainly required me to, to be creative in some of the things <laughs> that I'm doing, but thankfully, you know, through this process, I've been able to learn how to make it work, so. Well, can you say a little bit more about what you've done to adapt? Well, I think part of it was figuring out what platform to use and then to do whether the synchronous versus asynchronous. I originally tried the asynchronous with the recording and figuring out that most of my students would be within like three hours of the class. It would not necessarily be a problem to have it be um, synchronous. So then once I was able to do that, then I was like, okay, I'm in my element. I'm working with them. So keeping the discussion going, whether it would be having them kind of raising their hands in class and me calling on them in the online virtual arena and them kind of speaking in that way, encouraging people to use the chat to answer questions, which I think has been really helpful for, you know, our, our introverts. And, you know, it's just kind of also funny to see how some of the conversation evolve in the chat, all on topic, all um, kind of based on what we're talking about. But I think you get a, even a little bit more interaction than you would sometimes in the classroom in that way. I would always have handouts where it's not like a quiz, but like a let's test your knowledge and see how well you've taken in these concepts. I use Blackboard Collaborate, so being able to put that on the screen and then do polling, using the polling as a way to kind of gauge how they're answering questions. But I think just kind of having that interaction and then having them us like talk about it has been really helpful. So it's as much as I can kind of keep the dynamics of what we did beforehand in the classroom. And I think it's gone over well. You're the first person we've spoken to who's talked about collaborate rather than Zoom. Do you feel that maybe it's the collaborate environment that's helpful or is it just the um, strategies and relationships you have with the students? That matters. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I was kind of digesting all the materials that you all were sending as best as I could. I had a class that same week, a class session that same week, we went online like before spring break. Right. And so I had to do a lot really quickly. And at the time, we didn't have Zoom, a, a, a site license kind of for Zoom. So right. I think in some ways for me, it was, you know, I was looking at different options, but Zoom wasn't one of them that I was considering. And so I was able to kind of look at the, all the videos that you all had produced about how to use Blackboard Collaborate. I also did a lot of Google searching on it. And I was just able to see like, oh, okay, I can do this. Oh, I can do polls. Oh, that's awesome. You know, oh, I can do breakout groups. That's great. Oh, I can share the screen and show videos. So I think, you know, I was able to do it and it was all in Blackboard already. So all the students are already there. And, you know, I already use Blackboard to share a lot of different materials with them. So 
once I figured out on my end what I was doing, I think it was kind of a natural integration. And then I was able to set it up so the students could practice. Like I had a trial session up and open so they could like see what it would look like um, before we did the actual first class. And um, yeah, it went well. So I think when we got the site license for Zoom, I had already done a class. It went really well. So I just, you know, stuck with it. Is there a puzzle that you really had to solve of something that you like to do with your students that you were like, how am I going to replicate that when we're not face to face? Yeah, well, I mean, probably one of the biggest puzzles is I feel like, you know, when I'm up there teaching, I'm kind of in this live interactive performance (laughs) and just trying to figure out the interactive piece, which I kind of talked about a little bit, is just how to how do I get that interaction where they know that I'm interested in them as human beings? And I think when you don't, I can't see all their faces. To me, that's the biggest puzzle, right? For me, I take feedback in terms of what I'm seeing. You know, am I seeing confused faces? Am I seeing, you know, not heads nodding along or just kind of how to get that in-person feedback? I think that to me was I wasn't sure how to that was going to work. But I think, you know, just starting out that first session with one of the things I told them was I didn't sign up to teach an online course and you didn't sign up to take an online course. So we're just going to have to be really flexible with each other and give me your feedback. Let me know what you think so I can make adjustments if this isn't working or if you like something that's working. Also, they can tell me the good stuff. Um, (laughs) But (laughs) I think um, just letting them know that I was open to kind of hearing what they had to say so I could make it better or change things that needed to be changed was helpful. And that first course session, I spent the first, well, gosh, maybe 15, 20 minutes just checking in, like, how are you guys doing? What's happening? This is crazy, isn't it? You know, and I think they're used to me being very open and chatting about what's going on. So I feel that just set up like this is what we did before and talk to me. And I think it's worked since then. Yeah. Right. It's worked pretty well. It really does feel like it's important to give time for Mm -hmm. that and not have that sense of like, okay, how are you guys doing? Okay. Moving on. Chapter four, you know, sure, (laughs) right. Say, how are you doing? Let it breathe a minute. Right. Yeah. And I think it was really good for them to hear each other talk and about, it was good for me. I mean, selfishly, because it's like, oh, I want to know what they're doing because how they're learning what I have to teach them depends on how they're doing, right? So, but I think it was also really good for them to be able to hear each other and commiserate on the struggles, but also talk about just what was going on and how it could be anxiety producing and kind of scary. And then for the seniors, what this meant for them, I think giving them that space was really helpful. And I've done that throughout. Are there resources or thinkers or articles or ideas that have been useful or inspiring to you in this time? I'm part of the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity. Fordham is a member of that institution and they have a lot of really great resources generally, but they really also have stepped up during this time that we're in to provide some additional resources. I was part of the faculty success program and we kind of have this ongoing chat like we have with in classes, but it's for, you know, the faculty and encouraging each other, providing resources, but also just this nice space where we can just be real and talk about what some of our struggles are and some of the issues that we've been having. So that's been, I think, also a really nice resource that I've been able to use. I'm really happy to hear that the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity has been so helpful to you. Mm -hmm. I love that program. I've done their 14-day writing challenges, and I subscribe to her email newsletters. And that's a resource that Rafael Zapata, the Chief Diversity Officer, brought to campus. It's kind of a genius program. It's so supportive, full of kind of really realistic advice about the challenges of being a faculty member. I mean, that's that's what I've found just from kind of eavesdropping in the margins of it. I yes. sure wish I had it when I was junior faculty member. Yeah, I think it's been really helpful for me. Very, very helpful. And it's nice to have, you can have like an academic buddy that you sign up to, like a writing partner that someone's kind of keeps you accountable. And also if you do the faculty success program, you can have like a group and someone from my group member that I was in, uh, the group that I was in in the spring of last year, 
um, when I did that particular program, she and I now like have regular calls, you know, we're just kind of academic friends now, even though oh, she's in Tennessee, great. she's in a totally different area of, of work, but a field, but we're able to kind of talk about our successes, struggles, you know, and it's been really, really helpful. I think it's a great resource and I, and I hope more faculty take advantage of it. What are some good things to do between live sessions? Do you have any thoughts about or that you could share about some things that you've been doing? Um, yeah, I opened the discussion board. I hadn't used it when we were in person, but I opened the discussion board to see if they had any questions on things. That doesn't get used as much as I would think, but they, you know, they tend to email me more like they used to do, <laughs> um, which is fine. But um, I feel like at this point, especially so many have probably similar questions, but I've opened that up. And just kind of going back to the keeping the routine and the consistency, I have my office hours at the exact same time, Tuesdays from one to three, where I have my Zoom room opened where they can come in, pop in just like they would in normal office hours. I think that has been really helpful for them too, because uh, again, it's just like, that's what we did before. So I'm going to keep doing that. And I'm, it's open. It's there anytime they can pop in and I just turn on my video um, and my mic and we start chatting. That's another way. And, and like always, I always had, if they can't do office hours, they can always set up something with me individually for an appointment. So uh, I, yeah, I think just keeping those regular modes of communication open. I just let them know when we're in class that they can always kind of reach out and I just check in and see how things are going. You know, they feel pretty comfortable in doing so. It's kind of what I set out in the beginning. Just right. I can make things better for them if I know if it's working well or not. So I think that's been helpful. I'm drawing certain conclusions based on how you talk about your work and your relationship with the students. That seems to me to indicate that a certain kind of classroom environment or relationship that you cultivate has made switching to this online environment, I don't want to say easier, but it maybe provided you with something to build on. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, I, I would say so. Yeah, and I certainly wouldn't be using the word easy like you said. <laughs> like, right. I feel like it has not been easy, but... I feel like, yeah, maybe it kind of helped with that. Um, and another thing you just asking that question made me think about is I recognize that this is a really challenging time for everybody, faculty and the students, administration, everybody. And I think, yes, keeping that, whatever the environment was that I set up going, and then also recognizing this is a really challenging time. So I haven't changed my standards on the work that they're doing, but... I think I've been more, you know, understanding that we're in a different environment. So for example, the length of the exam that I normally give this particular class, they have four exams. And the length of the exam that I just gave them this Tuesday was um, shorter than the length of the exam if it was in person. So they had already done two with me and this was the third. And I also made it open book, which it normally isn't because I'm like, well, it just, I think, they're there, let's just, you know, instead of making it an academic integrity issue, I told them to continue studying, all that stuff they would normally do, and only use those as kind of a backup to check their work. I'm not trying to make it harder, I think is what my what I'm trying to say. It's a hard enough situation, and so I'm not trying to make it harder. The decreasing the number of questions on the exam isn't to make it easier for them, but it's just to account for what if their internet connection conks out, right? And they miss 20 minutes of the right. session. So this way, I just kind of accounted for, you know, if I make the test shorter, it kind of gives them that buffer if something were to happen with their internet connection or something like that. You know, I think just being reasonable in terms of what the expectations are and also having to be flexible myself. They have to do a research requirement for this particular class and they used to do in-person studies. Well, right. now they can't do those. They were able to go to kind of colloquia before, but now they're, most of them have been canceled. So I went through and I looked back at all of the colloquia we have done before, and then I added them into this, my revised syllabus so they can use those and then just write up some bullet points to show me that they watched it, right? And that could count as their credit hours. That seems like such a creative and smart solution. You thought about what are the learning goals that we had for this class? What's a way that we can meet those goals given the resources that we have now? Can you talk a little bit about how this has affected 
your um, clinical supervision. We opened up the, the Fordham Psychology Clinic, the community clinic, just opened in January of this year, servicing the Bronx and, you know, greater New York City area. Part of it was us getting, you know, patients up and ready, but we still were new with these patients and these groups and, you know, having to make that change has been because we have a lot of ethical things that we have to think about in terms of psychology, in terms of can we do telehealth? Is that ethical? Can we make sure that we are providing security for personal information through these sources? So there's been a lot of discussion broadly through the psychology area about that. And it's, you know, one of the things that's been really great about our department, they've been remarkably supportive and also recognizing that different supervisory groups have different needs. We're kind of being flexible with that. So we are still holding supervision. Like I said, different supervision groups. There's a child group, there's an adult group, uh, an assessment group, and a forensic assessment group. They proceeded kind of differently, but I think it's the same things that we do for our lecture courses of providing kind of support, seeing where they are. They've had a lot of the graduate students in clinical, you know, they're no longer getting those clinical hours that they need for internship because a lot of the places that they work are no longer seeing patients or have transitioned to telehealth. And there's a lot of issues in terms of ethics with graduate students doing telehealth. So it's really complicated, but I think we are just trying our best to be there for the the students. We meet with them um, and provide supervision to them as they need, but it's in, just in a very different kind of context now. A little bit more on some of the things that they're kind of dealing with and some of them are being able to continue their clinical work and their externships through telehealth some aren't we're just kind of being as flexible as we can be with them as well in terms of some of their needs that really is a huge wrinkle in terms of time to degree for people in terms of patients in terms of funding right that's tricky certainly our department has been really try to be, I think, really supportive with the students and I think are succeeding. The American Psychological Association has been really, really on the forefront on how to kind of address some of these issues and being flexible in certain areas. So I think people are are recognizing it's just a remarkably unique time that we're in, trying their best to be able to support the graduate students who kind of need some of this for their next steps to kind of continue moving them on. What do you do to feel like yourself when you're working in this unfamiliar way? How are you keeping up your sense of yourself as Professor Burke when you're sitting in your apartment? (laughs) Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, I don't, I honestly, I think, you know, interacting with the students helps me feel that way. You know, it was actually probably the hardest week for me, honestly, was spring break because it was all still really new. Everything felt really scary and anxiety provoking. And what am I doing? And so I think once I got my own routine and consistency back with the students that helped me, but also then it's, you know, I'm keeping up my lab meetings. So I also have undergraduates kind of in my lab and um, another graduate student from a different lab helping out as well. So kind of being able to get those meetings back up and running and seeing all their lovely faces that week after spring break as well really helped me, I think, in that in that sense. How's your lab been affected by this? So, yeah, you know, I work with children and families, and so we had to stop data collection because, you know, I couldn't have them coming into the lab anymore. That research is currently on hold. We're still doing phone screens with families remotely just in case we, you know, at some point in time can get back up and running and and seeing folks. It's on hold, really. We're getting back to stuff that we used to do before, like journal clubs. I'm have, you know, signing them an article to read related to the the area of research that, you know, I'm in, either in, uh, you know, something related to eating disorders, or obesity, and marginalized populations. Just trying to keep some consistency with them as well. I think is important. We're trying to make it work, but it is it is tough. It's tough, especially when you're working with human subjects. So. Sounds really tough. I don't want this to sound like a pressure question, right? Because I I don't know the answer to this for myself. But as you've kind of been forced to stop data collection, as the kind of some of the more active parts of your research have been put on pause for the moment, have you had a thought of, is there a thing like, well, now we'll finally have the time to do this thing that I never could do? Or... Can you get to a place where you can imagine doing that? Or is that 
too ambitious a question. I'm torn as I'm asking this because <laughs> like that fantasy of, you know, in the pause, maybe you do something that you couldn't have done before. And my other belief, which is, you know, we're living through a crisis and, you know, part of what we do when we're in a crisis is just cope with the crisis. And maybe what we're doing is learning how to cook a new pasta dish or something. Right. I've been very creative in the kitchen. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think like in those first, probably after the first week of, you know, that March 9th week where we went from face to face to in person kind of in the span of a day and a half. And I think once that week went by, you know, you know, they were posting about these people who have done these like kind of heroic feats, books that they've written, theories that they've, you know, all oh, kinds yeah. of things. This whole Isaac Newton discovered the calculus during the Exactly, mm -hmm. right. But then, you know, there was pushback to that, which was I was very happy to see. Because no, I mean, in the ideal world, like, oh, yeah, great, I can get all these papers written that I wanted to get written. And it's hard to do that when you're faced with, I have 78 year old parents and I'm trying to make sure that they're safe and they're getting what they need. So they're not at additional risk. Um, when I'm not sure what's going on in my own city here in the Bronx, when everything has been upended and I'm trying to figure it all out. That takes cognitive resources. And contrary to popular belief, we do not have an infinite resource of co cognitive resources. You know, we get taxed. So I think even though I had all these wishes and desires, I think very quickly it came to the point where I recognized this is not healthy and, or helpful for me. And for some folks, they might be doing those things and God bless them. Right. Um, but for, for me, it was, all right, how can I best keep myself healthy, keep my family healthy and kind of do the job that I need to do well enough to make sure mm -hmm. all those other things are also happening. So yeah, no, I'm not doing anything groundbreaking, but, um, <laughs> and I think part of that was that spring break week of figuring out when all I wanted to do was get things done and make a lot of progress. And what was happening was the exact opposite of that. You know, I kind of had to come to terms with, okay, it's okay to be not kind of producing. It's okay to, you know, kind of be mourning what is my normal everyday life. That's okay. And then once I can get through that period, then I can start kind of being productive again. So, right. so yeah, so now I'm in that much better place right now. Is there anything else you feel like you want to share about your teaching, about what this transition has been, something that we didn't get a chance to talk about that you wanted to touch on? One thing I don't understand is um, why some professors and teachers are making it harder for their students. That I just, that part I don't understand. And asking them how things are going, some students have talked about how some of them were making it things more difficult and more challenging. And um, that's something that I kind of wish we as a profession weren't doing. Like I said, I think this is hard enough for everybody, including faculty, but certainly also for students. Keeping things status quo would be one thing if it's at all possible within your course, but then I'm trying not to make it harder for them at this point. This is yeah. not the time. I've been hearing that too from some of my students and I don't totally understand it. One of my hypotheses though is that one way that some faculty feel their normal, feel themselves to be doing their job, is actually to give their students more to do. I think it's a good point that you raise that um, we have to remember everybody's in a different point. Like in, even in my class today, I sign up for the New York City COVID-19 alerts and um, they're mostly about social distancing and, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But today one came through while I was teaching, um, came popped up on the computer about, you know, not just free meals for K through 12, but free meals for adults. So I, you know, I made sure I announced that to the class and I gave them the information because some of them may have themselves or other people they know. You know, one of my areas of interest is food insecurity. So you right. know, someone may not, now their their family is struggling or they're struggling financially and they may not have food, then they're not going to be learning as well because you can't think if you're not adequately nourished, providing those resources, um, at least for those who are still in New York City, 
I thought was kind of helpful as my own little public service announcement. I think we're not all at our best all the time on a good day, on a normal day, but certainly not in this kind of environment. I think we all need to have a little bit of compassion and kind of understand that generally folks, generally, um, and I think especially our students, our our Fordham students are, are trying their best. And I think we should think about the the broader group of folks who are generally just trying their best and, and they're usually putting their best effort in and uh, kind of go with that mindset, um, I think would be helpful. Tell us about a teacher that's been really important in your life. Someone who sticks out to me is Mrs. Fitzhenry, who was my sixth grade English teacher. <laughs> She was really a stickler. Like she had rules and she expected you to follow them. Mm -hmm. But I think she really cared about her students. She was, I don't know, I think just that she cared. You knew she was kind of a softy, but, you know, she had a little bit of a kind of a harder exterior. And I, I think I always value that, that like, you know, she has a lot of expectations for us and she wants us to do well. And she has her rules, but uh, she wants the best for us kind of overall. And I feel like that's a lot of my philosophy. So I feel like I'm nice and I like to bring humor in the classroom, but I'm also a pretty big stickler for rules and my expectations. And yes, when I put in the syllabus, that's what I mean. And, (laughs) um, you know, no, when it says no extra credit on that, no, there's no extra credit on that. Um, I give you plenty of opportunities. Clearly, it stuck out to me so that that's kind of how she was. And um, yeah, and I can still remember her walking around the classroom, which is really saying something considering my memory. But I feel Mrs. T- Mrs. Fitenry, she was really encouraging, too. And so I think that stands out to me. She's somebody who stands out to me. We just happen to have Mrs. Fitzhenry right here. <laughs> That would have been awesome. (laughs) I hope she's well wherever she is. (laughs) Great to talk to you. Thank you both. I appreciate the opportunity. Twice Over Podcast is available on SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Spotify, with new episodes appearing twice each week. For host and guest bios and show notes, please visit our website, TwiceOverPodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter at TwiceOver1 or email us at TwiceOverPodcast at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.